praise our Lord and how great and mighty that he is. And now we're going to say, I stand amazed in the presence of the Lord. Come on, your hands, 143. saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. And it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another angel, uh, I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory.
the book of Revelation chapter 16. So let's just go through this real quick to bring you up to speed where we're at. This is the cross of Jesus Christ. The resurrection occurred. That's Pentecost to the rapture. That's called the church age. That's the age that we're living in today in 2022. We're living in the church age. We're living in the greatest age ever known to mankind. I just tell you that flat out. There's no greater age than right now, no greater time to live on the earth than right now. Because of why? Because of God's great grace that we see over and over and over again. And we're going to see today, sadly, that that grace will be cut off for mankind for a period of time. And we're going to see that. But this is where we're at. I believe we're right here, close, if not on the edge, of the rapture of the church. The arrow's going up because the church is going to go up, and we'll meet him in the air. Okay, that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. All right? So make sure that you understand this so you know where we're at. The rapture of the church will happen, and at the uh, beginning of that rapture of the church, when that occurs, there'll be a time of seven years between the rapture of the church and the revelation or the second coming of Christ. Okay, I, I know I just said a lot there. Three and a half years and three and a half years. We've broken those down for you here. The seven sealed judgments will occur first. You'll see the two witnesses preach there in Jerusalem, and there'll be 144,000 Jewish evangelists. These are men who are virgins who will give their uh, 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 whole life to praising God and preaching the gospel all over the world to those who have never heard it. And let me tell you today, in the technology age that we live in, it's almost unthinkable that no one has ever heard of the gospel, but there are literally, watch this, millions of people that have never heard the gospel presentation. Never. We live in America, which is supposed to be, or used to be, a Christian nation. And it would be a tragedy for anybody to live next to you and not know the gospel. I just tell you that. If you've never given the gospel to anyone, how can you hate people that much? You say, man, if you put it that way, that's a little different. You are giving the gospel. You've been given the gospel if you're saved. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, 1 John 4, 4. And you ought to be telling others about Christ and about what he's done for you. And allowing them, what, either to receive or to reject Jesus Christ. But there are countless people that have never heard the gospel. So we need to do that because he's coming back. The rapture of the church first, seven years. This last three and a half years is the seven trumpet judgments. The last trumpet judgment... The last seal judgment includes the seven trumpet judgments. The last trumpet judgment includes the seven vial or bowl judgments. And that's what we'll get into today. Then you'll see the kings join Antichrist. The kings of the world will join Antichrist, and they will come to the Battle of Armageddon, the battle a campaign. It's not one battle. It's several battles, and it actually doesn't... It actually doesn't even happen in Megiddo, which is interesting. The place of Megiddo, Armageddon that you hear, Armageddon is uh, uh, the, the hill of Megiddo. That's where he's going to bring them together. You'll see this in the book of Ezekiel. And he will bring them down and they will attack Jerusalem. And when they attack Jerusalem, the coming of Christ will be there. The, the second coming of Christ, the revelation... And he will speak, and they will all die. When I say that, do you realize the God that you serve? How powerful he is. Now, you take that in consideration to any issues you have in life, anything that you're facing in life, what you're facing compared to annihilating the entire world right in front of your eyes with one word, it's very small what we face. 
compared to the power that he has. So I just want to encourage you. Be encouraged. We have a great God. There's only one Lord. There's only one God, Jehovah. There's not multiple ones. There's only one. And he's greater than all. So that's who we worship, and that's who we serve, and that's who we sing about. That's who he is. That's good news. Some of you ought to smile about that, because it's really good news. The only reason you wouldn't smile is because why? Because you're not on his side. And if you're not on his side, let me tell you, there's grace for today. There's grace for today. And you can be on his side, but you have to acknowledge him and you have to bow the knee. You say, I'm not doing that for anybody. Have it your way, friend. But you will. You'll either do that here or you definitely will do it when you stand before him. Make no bones about it. No matter what you think and no matter the way that you want it to go, it's always going to go God's way. And his way, by the way, is perfect. It's complete. There's nothing ever wrong with it. Because why? Because he alone is God. And you're not and I'm not. We're infinitely short of the perfection that we need to be in his family. So don't say, well, hey, I'm working, doing the best that I can. Because this is what works gets you. It gets you the great white throne judgment. At this second coming of Christ, you will start the thousand-year millennial reign. That's the millennium. That's a thousand years, literally a thousand years. The ones that begin that millennium or millennial reign right here, every single one of these people that begin here are born-again Christians. They're believers, all of them. And they will have kids. Be interesting. I don't think the gay population will rise up at that point. They'll have kids. A man and a woman will have kids, and they will have them productively and efficiently. And those kids, just like today, they either have to receive or reject Jesus Christ, who rules and reigns, by the way, in Jerusalem. If you're new here today and you say, man, I've always wondered what in the world is all this Jerusalem stuff about, and why are we always talking about Israel? I mean, like they are nothing compared to the world. My friend, you have to understand, they're God's chosen people, and they are something. Because God said, I will give them their land. I will do that. He said, no one else will. I will do that. He spread them across the world. Because why? Because they were disobedient to him. And many times, like us, we want to do it our way. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. We want to do it our way, but it is not the right way. And they said, well, we're going to do it our way. And by the way, we want to be like everybody else. So give us a king. You remember that? They got King Saul. He was a stud, man. He was the tallest dude in town, handsome, looked great. He was a good guy. But he told them, you're going to have issues. You're going to have problems. But you wanted it. You asked for it, you wanted it. So I'm going to give you him. And so they got King Saul. And then finally they got King David. King David was a good guy. But he was like you and me, he was a sinner. He committed murder and he had adultery. And he really messed up. But never forget this, he really repented. And you may be here today and you say, you don't have any idea about my background. No, I don't. But I know the one that died for you and loves you unconditionally. He knows everything about it. And he says, come for whosoever will let him come. That's great news. That's really good news. But the end of this thousand year millennial reign, there'll be a short season. The Bible says this, and we'll get this into this in the book of Revelation, where he'll let Satan loose. And he gathers all of the unbelievers together. And you say, well, there's only got to be a handful of those. No, sadly, there'll be a lot of them. And they will, once again, go against Satan. Uh, with Satan, they'll go against the Savior. And once again, they will lose. 
and they will stand before the great white throne judgment and be judged, how? On their works. Two religions in town. One's already done, and the other's works. And if you're trying to do your very best, quit it. You'll never make it. You'll never make it. Say, I need you, and I need you, God, and I need you now because I cannot live the life that you've commanded me to live. You said in your word, God, be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. I can't do that. You're exactly right. That's the whole point. You can't do it without him. And so he is telling you and me today, make sure that you're born again. What do you mean born again? Born from above. That you have Jesus Christ as your heavenly father. And he's your savior and your Lord. And that he's the captain of your life. That's what he's saying all throughout the book of Revelation. I'm coming. I told you judgment's coming. And I'm telling you what's going to happen. There's no gracious, more gracious, more gentleman than Jesus Christ telling you and me exactly what's going to go on. And you would sit down with your friend, you would sit down with your child, you would sit down with your teen, your adult child, you would say, you see this? It would be ridiculously stupid not to do what he says to do. And you'd say, yeah, that totally makes sense. But the vast majority, watch that word, not the vast minority, the vast majority says, I don't want that. I don't want that. I'll do it my way. So if you're here and you do it your own way, you will go through this period of judgment at some point. You probably won't last long because the judgment will come. You say, not me. I'm going to receive the mark. I'll be able to buy and sell, and things will be fine. Don't ever forget, payday is coming. You will sow, and you will reap. And what you're sowing, you will reap more than you've sown. It's a universal principle found in Galatians chapter 6. You can't get around it. And I don't care if you're religious, I don't care if you're lost, I don't care if you're saved, I don't care if you're a priest, whoever you are, it's a universal principle that what you and I sow, we shall reap. So with that being said, that being said, we need to make sure that we're prepared to meet the Lord. You think about this in the last two years. You have personally seen many, many people die. Many people. And by the way, we just haven't noticed, but that's been going on forever. Many, many people have been, been dying. Many people have been dying of the flu for years. So as those things ratchet up, and there's a focus and a big light put on that, I don't know how clearer God can make it to us all. He's made it very clear. And so as we jump into Revelation chapter 16, we're looking in Revelation chapter 16, and we're going to look at the vials being literally poured out. The vials being poured out, and I'm not talking about just poured out like you would think and like I think, a vial. You think of a little vial there and it's poured out like it. Nope. This is literally a bowl that's being flung out and it's sprayed everywhere. You get that picture of better? Be like taking a, a, a shallow bowl and taking some, here we go, tomato soup and just splashing it all over the place. You say, Wow. If you get that picture in mind, you'll see this is exactly what's going to go on. His wrath, and remember, it's God's wrath. It's not Satan's wrath. 
It's God's wrath, and God's using what's there to fulfill what he said would go on. So it's his wrath that's being poured out on mankind. Okay, so we're here. This is where we're at. Uh, this is where we're at, right? Uh, here. As we talk about this, we're right here with the seven vile bold judgments. We'll get to this next week, and we'll get to this the week after that, uh, and we'll see this happen. But right here is where we're at. We're on the seventh trumpet judgment, and that includes the seven vials, and we're going to go through some of them today, not all of them. And so to bring you up to date, that's where we're at. And you can take notes on that. You can get another sheet and say, man, I want to take some more notes on that. That would be great. Because many times people are going to ask you, if you, if you believe the Bible and you read the Bible at all, people's going to ask you, hey, what do you think about this stuff? Is this really real? And wouldn't it be great for you just to say, yeah, this is really going to happen. This is really going to happen. This is what God's word says. This is what God's word says. And make no mistake, what God says comes to pass. It always does. All right. So as you take notes, number one, the judgment commanded. All right. The judgment commanded. You see this in verse one of chapter 16, the judgment commanded. John says this, and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Much that follows is reminiscent of the plagues that were called down by Moses on the land of Egypt. If you'll just, and we've said this many times through the book of Revelation, just remember the Old Testament. If you get the Old Testament and you understand the stories and the history in the Old Testament, then you say, okay, this makes sense. He's done this before. Okay, this has happened on a smaller scale before. But it was always a shadow. It was always something that was previewed that this is coming. All right? We've seen some of these. Boils, water turned to blood, darkness, frogs, thunder, hail. This all happened in Egypt, you remember. Every bit of this. It's coming to pass. For this reason, much that follows, more so than the other judgments, is probably literal. It'll literally happen. The judgment angels standing in solemn line with the bowls in their hands, the vials are now issued the word of command, and like a lightning flash, they go forth on their errands of doom. In that three and a half, last three and a half years, we're not given a whole lot of particulars in the book of Revelation. Okay? We're not given a whole lot of particulars. You can find this in Ezekiel. You can find this in Daniel. Those, Daniel, remember, is the history of Gentiles. Remember this. Ezekiel is the history of the Jewish people. So those things are played out in those books, and you're told what's going to happen. So we're looking here, and he's going to the end, and he's saying right before Jesus Christ comes, these vials are going to be let out. And I believe there'll be one right after another, after another, after another, and I don't think it's going to be much time. Because when you read about these vials, every one of them says everything will turn to blood. Everyone will have the sores. All, every, it's complete it's complete in what he's doing. And so it's not a third anymore. It's not half. It's everyone. Everyone. So watch that and pay attention to that. Number one, the judgment commanded. But number two, the judgment commenced. The judgment commenced. We see this in verses 2 through verse 9. The exodus of these avenging angels is no wild stampede. Understand this, it is an orderly procession as each angel in turn peels off from the descending formation to pour out his specific vial. All right, number one, we see the cancer, letter A, the cancer of the seal. The cancer of the seal. What happens first is most fitting. Verse 2 says, and the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his angel. Those who had the mark of the beast and worshipped the angel that we saw in the end of chapter 13 of Revelation are all those unbelievers. 
And remember what I said, it's not like you're going to get the mark of the beast and somebody's going to covert come under and put something in you and you've got it. You will know it, you will stand, and you will say, I will have it. I'll take it, you put it in my forehead, or you can put it in my hand, but I will take it, and I will know it. And by the way, everybody else will too. Because what do we say? Satan is and wants to be, he wants to be just like God. What did God do? He came in and he stamped those believers, those evangelists, those 144,000. Everybody knew who they were. What did Satan do? Everybody's going to know who my people are. Because I told you I want to be like you in Isaiah chapter 14. Five times he said that. I want to be like you. I'm going to do what you, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. There's no way that Satan can become God because he is infinitely below God. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. He's going to try to be like him. The best that he knows how, he's going to try his best. He's wicked. He wants to be God himself, and he wants to be worshipped. Not God to be worshipped. So every one of those who says, I want the mark, I receive the mark, every one of them, all of them will have this cancer of the seal. Mankind has been well warned what would happen if they accepted the slave brand of the beast. That ceaseless torment would be theirs and that they would not be able to rest day or night. He told them it would happen. Who can re rest when tormented by a great, festering, painful sore? You ever had one? It's not fun at all, and it'll drive you nuts. There on the right hand, a horrible, putrefying, incurable cancer. There on the face, a loathsome, ugly, disfiguring, and agonizing blotch. Unbelievers become horrible to look upon, and their pains never end. That's the very first vial. Vial number two. The contamination of the sea. Something you've never seen, but I tell you what, we live in a place where you ought to visibly be able to kind of comprehend this thing going on. You've been to the ocean. You go to the ocean. You see the ocean. We see that around here all the time. See what happens. The environment suffers next. John says in verse 3, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. In Moses' day, it was the Nile that was turned to blood. Now it's the sea itself. And what a sight! The heaving billows become one vast stench of crimson putrefaction rolling in from the deep toward the coastlines of the world, heaving themselves upon the reefs and rocks, breaking with a vile stench upon the shores. Can you see it? The, re the retreating waves of blood litter the sand with the rottening carcasses of its dead. The globe is girdled by death. John Phillips speaks about our infamous red tide occurrences. How many of you ever been around here where we've had red tide? All of you? Okay. Some of you haven't been. It's no fun. It really is no fun. And especially if you're pregnant. If you're pregnant and you've been around red tide, it makes you really sick. Really sick. Because it's dangerous. But this is what, this is interesting. I wrote this so you could see this. John Phillips, uh, what he says, he says, from time to time off the coast of California and elsewhere, a phenomenon known as the red tide occurs. These red tides kill millions of fish and poison those who eat contaminated shellfish. In 1949, one of these red tides hit the coast of Florida. First, the water turned yellow, but by midsummer, it was thick and viscous with countless billions of dinoflagellates, tiny one-celled organisms. 
60 mile windrows, that's rows of stinking fish fouled the beaches. Much marine life was wiped out. Even bait used by the fishermen died upon the hooks. Eventually, the red tide subsided only to appear again the following year. Eating fish contaminated by the tide produced severe symptoms caused by a potent nerve poison, a few grams of which distributed aright could easily kill everyone in the world. An unchecked population explosion of toxic dinoflagellates would kill all of the fish in the sea. The phenomenon is well known, but scientists do not know what causes the proliferation of these creatures or what normally limits it, end quote. I can tell you the answer, God. But hey, that's not a scientific view, I know. God's in control of everything that goes on. I show you this picture, not to gross you out, but to show you, you've seen this here. I've seen this here. And you've seen this and what this does. Can you imagine that sea of water there, blood? And all of those fish, all of the things in blood, dead. That's just the second vial. He's just getting warmed up. We aren't even midway through. And this is what happens. That may not fully explain what will happen when the second vial is outpoured, but it certainly illustrates it. The disaster described is quite believable. Third thing, let us see the corruption of the streams. The corruption of the streams. The description of this new judgment is somewhat longer. Our attention is drawn, first of all, to the reality of this judgment. The reality of the judgment, all right? What's he say? Verse 4, And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. An ecological disaster in the sea is bad enough, but what will it be like when rivers and lakes and fountains and streams are likewise corrupted? I mean, let me think about this. When all sources of fresh water turn to blood, as they did in Egypt in the days of Moses, men's horror and despair will know no bounds. The Lord's first miracle was to turn water into wine. Now he turns water into blood. And it's not only happening in the seas, it's happening everywhere that water's running. We observe next the righteousness of this judgment. The righteousness. Look at what he says in verse 5. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Hey, don't ever forget, your sins will find you out. Your sins will find you out, and you're not going to kill all the prophets. You're not going to kill all of the Christians that's been telling you what's going on and get away with it. You won't. What goes around comes around. What we say? You sow and you reap. You see what's going on here? Do you see that? Do not miss this. I want you to see that. This statement shows the angels have authority over what men call the forces of nature. The way people talk about nature and the way that mother nature and all, it is crazy. It's crazy. Earlier in Revelation 7, 1, we read of angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding the winds. You remember that? The angel whose responsibility is to guard the water supplies of earth instantly recognizes the poetic justice of God in turning the rivers and fountains into blood. And the beast and his followers have shed the blood of the martyrs in rivers, and now they are given blood to drink. 
God pays down their wages with a firm and a righteous hand and with a just but terrible, terrible coin or payment. Our attention then draws to the response to this judgment in verse 7. John says, And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Some versions say this. It says, And I heard the altar say. The altar speaks. You say, what's that all about? The altar referred to this is the brazen altar, the altar of consuming judgment. The fires of which were to burn with ceaseless flame. And beneath that altar, you remember, have been sheltered the souls of those who were slain for their faith. And the altar itself is now given tongue and voice to shout it with loud amen to the judgment of God. The Bible begins with a martyrdom and with the blood of Abel crying out for vengeance. Now the altar itself cries out with a glad and thankful endorsement of the true and righteous judgment of God. What he says is going to come to pass, friend. Every last detail of it. Fourth thing you see is the catastrophe of the sun. And this is new. The catastrophe of the sun. The statement of what happens next is remarkably brief when compared with the dimensions of what literally happens. Look at verse 8 and 9. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. The false prophet had confirmed the beast and his position of power by calling down fire from heaven. You remember Revelation 13, 13. Now God pays back that lying miracle. This is one of those signs in the sun of which the Lord himself spoke of in the Gospels of Luke chapter 21, verse 25. It's right here. He talks about this. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. When God's son died upon the cross of Calvary, he put out the sun. You remember that? There was darkness all over the world. Now it will be quickened to renewed and terrible life. It'll be able to scorch people. And this universe is an amazing place. Think about this. God created, he created everything and placed it exactly where he needed it to be. The sun is some 93 million. That just, that's something. 93 million miles away from the earth. It sits at exactly the precise distance to allow life to exist on this planet. If the sun were any closer, we would literally vaporize. If it was any farther, we would literally freeze to death. Be frozen. The sun is a giant nuclear reactor. It is so large that 1.3 million of our Earths could fit inside of it. And it is hot, too. The surface of the sun is nearly 10,000 degrees. If that heat were to hit the earth full force, the planet would burn up instantly. And surrounding the earth is a band of radiation called the magnetosphere. Magnetosphere. This radiation band filters out the rays of the sun, allowing exactly the right amount of heat and light to enter our atmosphere. And during this plague... God will either turn up the heat of the sun or allow more of its heat to enter the earth's atmosphere. And as a result, mankind will experience intense burns in the bodies. I read about this week. The sun itself is subject to violent weather patterns. It's interesting. From time to time, tongues of flame leap out from the seething surface of the sun, erupting hot solar plasma as far as a million miles from the sun, and projecting x-rays, radio waves, light waves, electronic clouds, and destructive high-energy protons toward the earth. And when the earth 
is in a direct line with those eruptions, magnetic storms occur on Earth that disrupt communication systems and play havoc with sophisticated modern equipment. Some of you young people, can you imagine not having the Internet? Wow. That would be death. Some kids say that all the time. That would be terrible. You know, the giant flares cause the phenomenon in the sun known as sunspots. If you'll go back two more slides, that's called a sunspot on there. That's the sun. There, there's some sunspots on there. Now, think about this. One such flare occurred at 2.37 p.m. on November the 12th, 1960. But most of you weren't there. But there's quite a few of you there. And this is what was said happened. The resulting cloud of solar hydrogen gas measured 10 million miles across, trailed halfway back to the sun, 93 miles away, and 93 million miles away, and bombarded the earth at a speed of 4,000 miles a second. That's moving. It set off violent week-long disturbances on and around the earth and precipitated an electrical and magnetic storm of enormous proportions. Compass needles, wavered erratically, communications were blacked out, and the northern lights, they flared majestically. Yet that was a mere ripple in the steady, the steady flow of energy from the sun. The disaster on earth caused by the fourth vial might easily result from such explosion in the sun. It may or may not happen like that, but let me tell you this, it will occur, because God said it would. It will occur. Mankind will be scorched by great heat and will blaspheme God, hating him and blaming him for what is happening. For all their warm embrace of God-denying and God-defying creeds, for all their ready worship of the beast and the hearty endorsement of the lie, they will still know that there is a God and will implicitly acknowledge by their very blasphemies that he alone has power to cause the disasters now overtaking the earth. It's just hard to imagine you know the truth, and yet you still blaspheme his name. The judgment is commenced, and it's a little overwhelming. God begins the rescue of a world held in bondage by sin, by Satan, and his beasts. And with the remaining vials, the judgment of God will come home in giant strides to the heartland of the rebellion as the beast, his domain, and by the way, his capital city, Babylon, they'll be attacked and overthrown and the end will come with breathtaking speed. As we read the Bible and we understand that these plagues are God's wrath poured out on sinners who refuse to come to Him for salvation, these plagues are designed to judge those who have defied a holy God at every turn. And we read it and we understand the source and the solution. And I wrote this. What strikes me as amazing is the fact that these people understand what is happening too. They understand that God is behind these plagues. And instead of repenting, they stand in continued defiance to Him and to His will. And the Bible tells us in verse 9 that they blaspheme the name of God. It means to revile, to speak evil of. They shake their fists toward God and revile His holy name. They literally have the audacity to blame Him for their troubles and suffering. Of course, that has been the human way since the dawn of time. Things haven't changed, have they? 
who was really good at that? Genesis chapter 3, you have Adam and Eve. And we are masters at putting it off on someone else. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. Watch this. I'm an addict. Because it's someone else's fault. I drink too much because daddy and mommy drank too much at home. I do drugs and I love pornography because that's what I listened to and looked at and watched and was part of as I grew up in a home. So it's their fault. It's not mine. And I've chosen the homosexual lifestyle because it is a choice. It's not a birthmark. Because I was abused many times as a youngster. So I choose to do that. And we have become people who blame everybody else. And don't take responsibility for who we are and the choices that we make. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman... What is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Neither of them said, I did the wrong thing. I'm sorry, God. Will you forgive me? I made the wrong choice. I'm sorry. And we see this played over and over and over and over and over because the devil knows it works. Why change anything if it's working? And it continues to work even in the year 2022. Husbands blame wives, wives blame husbands, and everybody blames everybody else for their problems. Even under judgment, mankind will blame God for what they are suffering. But the problem is not with God. The problem is clearly stated in verse 9, and they repented not to give him glory. They refused to repent of their sins to the glory of God and they're paying a heavy price for their choice. They have no one to blame, and you have no one to blame, and I have no one to blame, except me, except you. If you fool around and die and go to the place that's reserved only for the devil and his angels... If you do that, you will have no one to blame but yourself. And friend, you could stop anywhere and call on the name of God and trust Him for salvation if you would just do it. If you do not, you will have nothing but judgment to expect. Because why? That's what He tells us. He never blindsides you and me. He always tells you up front, this is exactly what's going to happen. And you can make the choice and be delivered. The time for repentance is now. If you're not saved, you need to come to Jesus 
You need to be saved today. If you carry a burden for those who are headed to this horrible time called the tribulation, the time to pray for them, the time to tell them is now. If you love them. He promises those who receive him will take him and be with him. But those who reject him will see the full wrath of God upon them. You see, that makes clear sense. I know it does. My question to you, friend, are you in the family of God? And if you're not, what could possibly be more important than being in his family? For those who have heard the gospel and the rapture occurs, you will have crossed the line and you will not be able to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. The word of God says, and God will send them strong delusion. Those who enter into the tribulation period that have heard the gospel and have not received it, he will send them strong delusion. They will believe the lie. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an almighty God. His wrath will be poured out. But you don't have to go through that. He says, for whosoever will, let him come. And he calls all of mankind to come and receive him. I encourage you this morning, If you don't know him, I encourage you to run to him. Run to him. And it'll be the greatest decision you will ever make in your life. And when you give your life to him by receiving what he's done for you, he changes you. Don't miss this. You don't change you. He does. You become a new creature in Christ. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. You say, can he really do that? I don't think that'd be very hard, considering what we've talked about. He's already done, and he's going to do. Not hard at all. I encourage you just as you are to ask him to forgive you of your sins come into your life and to save you I promise you he promises if you will do that he will save your soul and you won't have to fear any of this at all I encourage you Make sure you know him today.